I'll provide a link um, at the end of it for you to get a one hour PD certificate. Um, and if you happen to have any questions that come up along the way, if you wanna pop them in the chat box, I'll manage that. Um, and then after Kate does a little bit of presenting, we'll pause for some questions and then we'll let things organically flow from there. So now I turn it over to Kate <laughs> Beaver. Thank you so much for being here, cool. Kate. Yeah, thanks for having me. This is great. It's a great opportunity to help my fellow arts professionals. Um, and I, I'll do a little talk about just what the music therapy work that I do, but then I've also tried to do some brainstorming about some of the techniques and interventions that music therapists use that might translate well into education settings, and especially during this time of distance learning, which I know has been a challenge for everyone, um, and especially people like me who are a little bit tech averse. <laughs> it's been a, a real learning curve to um, figure out all the different platforms and um, I think this is mostly music teachers. Is that right, Jason, on this call? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I've found a lot of challenges with especially simultaneously trying to make music over the internet is really difficult. Um, so I've been thinking a lot about ways to get over that hump too. So my background is actually in classical music. I studied uh, classical percussion performance at University of Southern Maine during my undergrad and still play a lot um, not as much classical music anymore, but I'm in a rock band and a, a quintet actually, um, which sounds like classical music, but we play a lot of metal shows. <laughs> so I play vibraphone and drums and all kinds of percussion instruments. And then I went on to do my master's in music therapy at New York University. And um, that program was very hands-on. So I did a couple internships at Sloan Kettering and Beth Israel Medical Center in New York working mostly with cancer patients and palliative care. So all end of life care of all ages. And that's still my focus now that I'm back in Maine. I, I moved back uh, about 10 years ago and started a private practice, Maine Music and Health, and work at Maine Medical Center two or three days a week in the um, inpatient center, pretty much with, with everyone, <laughs> car accidents and you name it, all kinds of things. And then the um, cancer clinic, I work outpatient. So doing um, bedside music therapy for people who are receiving transfusions and chemotherapy or um, pre and post surgery as well. And then outside of the hospital, I do a lot of in-home sessions with people with disabilities, ranging from Down syndrome to brain injuries, traumatic brain injuries, and um, Alzheimer's or dementia. Um, so a little mix of everything. And since the pandemic has started, I have been home um, for about seven weeks. So I've been doing a few sessions um, via Zoom and FaceTime and Skype and all the possibilities um, with some of my individual clients, but it's definitely been difficult just based on the way that I work. So music therapists have a range of, um, we all have the same training and background and we're board certified music therapists, but then we all get sort of extra trainings for specialty areas. And depending on where you went to school, you sort of learn a different methodology, I guess would be the right word. And at NYU, we did very improvisational, um, music-centered, person-centered music therapy. So the way that we work is to meet with someone and just improvise basically based on where they are in the moment. So none of the people I work with usually are musicians or have any training in music. So I bring instruments that are very accessible. So music teachers know like ORF instruments, that kind of thing, um, anything in a, in just one key set. So I have uh, like frame drums and percussion instruments that don't obviously need any chordal structure. And then I have a lot of instruments that are just in one key. So if you give someone a xylophone that just has notes out of G pentatonic, then you can play chords around that, like C and E minor and all kinds of things that um, create sort of a framework for that person's improvisation and make it really rewarding. So that unlike traditional music lessons, um, there's not necessarily wrong notes and people are just kind of engaged in the music without having to know a lot of theory or background around the instrument. So the reason that's been difficult over a distance is uh, 
and I'm sure you've run into this too, with the delay, especially, um, I don't know if it's just over Zoom, and Zoom is the only so far HIPAA compliant platform. So as a therapist, we have to use Zoom um, or some other like therapy platforms, but there's, there's just this issue of a, a sound delay. And so if I start the music and then the person jumps in, it's okay. Mm -hmm. You can kind of start a rhythm and they can sing along. And as long as you sort of ignore them, um, you're playing in the same time, but that obviously goes against what we're doing because you don't want to be ignoring what the person's doing. And usually as the music therapist, we're following the client. So I've been kind of brainstorming different ways to work in, you know, working in this challenge. And some of that has been just a lot more back and forth. And so once we open up for questions, um, I would love to just know like what, what you've been doing so far with your students and how we might be able to brainstorm some things together. Um, but I've moved to sort of a back and forth model where some of the conversation will be live, but then the person will make something and send it to me and then I can comment or add something to the recording and send it back. And I know some formats um, we use a lot with non-musicians and so they would be especially beneficial to younger students, elementary age students. The blues is a huge one, just using that 12 bar form of the blues and allowing for uh, musical improvisation if they have instruments or vocalizations but often I use it as a a way to kind of explore feelings and difficulties so having this question form that gets repeated and then answered in the last four bars um, can be really helpful if you just have somebody come up with a problem and if you're doing this in a group it's a really great activity for like a classroom full of kids to come up with a problem together and you're gonna sing that problem over the first four bars and repeat it. And then the last four bars, you wanna come up with a solution and you can do that as a group. So I've done this with kids and adults um, and people will come up with problems that are funny, um, kind of lighthearted things. And then some people will share real difficulties that they're going through, whether it's a divorce or um, a surgery that they're nervous about or a pet dying, all kinds of things will come up. And then the the problem solving portion of it as a group, you start to get a group talking about um, ways that we can help each other through difficult times. So you can kind of address uh, really difficult things in a format of a song that has a beginning, middle and end, and then make it a little bit more lighthearted by saying, oh, let's try to rhyme that last word. So we have to reframe the solution in a way that will rhyme with the problem. And I, people seem to really like that exercise because it is musical and then you can sing it together, you can record it. The blues form is very easy to learn for younger people. And it just kind of allows people to share as much or as little as they want. And it's a good way to recognize too that everyone is going through a really diff difficult situation in very different ways. So we have some kids who are maybe not living in the safest situation right now. Um, some kids just don't have the energy that other kids might have about what they are able to do from home. So even if they send in one word, you can incorporate that into a song somehow. So music therapy, we just really think a lot about accepting whatever people are able to give at any moment. And I think that's one thing that educators in general are kind of switching to right now, um, thinking less about you know, getting the right, the right note and maybe just offering any note <laughs> on certain days. Um, so yeah, thinking to some of the issues that are coming up, I always think about health in a very whole, wholesome way, I guess. So think about physical health, emotional health, cognitive health, and social health. And those are all being affected right now. People are very worried about their physical health, even if they are currently healthy. And then emotionally, I think there's a range. This is really a traumatic experience for everyone involved in different ways. So people might not even recognize that they are dealing with a, a trauma right now, but they're, they might be lashing out. They might be having behavioral issues that they haven't had before. So it's important to take care of our emotions and kind of acknowledge them and, and integrate them somehow. And music can be a really good way to do that as well. Um, some of the ways I think about 
emotional goals in music. One is just mindfulness. And I'm sure it's kind of a buzzword. Um, and I'm sure you've run into it in some other professional developments. But um, I think of mindfulness more as just sort of an awareness of ourselves and our feelings and our surroundings. And I think a lot about music and sound. So having a discussion about that is always fun with kids of all ages and adults. Um, what is the difference between music and sound and thinking about what sounds you hear around you during the day or if you step outside of your house or even open a window, what sounds do you hear and can you think about them in sort of a musical way? So giving that exercise as just either journaling or even using a phone or a sound recorder to pick up some of those things and then kind of think about the rhythms and how they interact and what sounds we have in our own bodies. Um, can help kids really become more mindful of what they might be feeling or paying attention to or what might be causing stress in their surroundings that they might not have even been aware of. Um, does that make sense? <laughs> cool. Um, and then taking it a step further, obviously there's a lot of ways to deal with stress and anxiety. Um, and for younger kids who might not even be able to name those feelings, the biggest one is just our awareness of our bodies and our breathing rate and our heart rate. We get into this kind of cycle with anxiety where if we're not breathing very deeply, we start to feel more anxious. And then because we feel anxious, we stop breathing as deeply and it just kind of goes in a circle. So if you can sneakily get people to breathe a little bit more deeply, then we'll stop that cycle midway and help people feel relaxed without really trying. And music is an excellent way to do that. As you all know, uh, we breathe better when we're singing and when we're training to sing, we have to learn to breathe properly, which is something it took me a long time to learn as a percussionist because <laughs> that wasn't really part of my training. Um, we don't have to think too much about our breath in the back of the, the orchestra. Um, so the thing I like to do for breathing is to have kids or adults pick their favorite song. This is a good self-exercise, self-care exercise too. So you can use really any kind of music. If you love to listen to heavy metal, if you love to listen to country, whatever it is, pick your favorite song and then just find the beat to that song. And then do a breathing exercise of four beats in, you breathe in, and four beats, you breathe out. And then start to extend it. So you breathe in for four beats and then out for six beats and then in for four beats and out for eight beats. And the purpose of that is to start breathing out more than you're breathing in so that um, if you're feeling really anxious, you're not, you don't have a lot of space to take more breaths in. So you have to kind of let it out longer than you breathe in at first. So if you can train people to do that to the beat of music, it becomes kind of a habit. So anytime you're hearing music, even if it's a fast song, you start to breathe in time to it and then you relax. And so there's this misconception that music for relaxation needs to be Pachelbel's Canon over a waterfall over and over. And that's actually not great for a lot of people um, because especially if you're feeling frustrated or anxious already, if you put something like that on, it's just gonna make you feel more frustrated sometimes. So we think a lot about the ISO principle and meeting people where they are. So if someone's feeling anxious and frustrated, um, or even if their energy is just like way up here and they're just not able to regulate that and calm down, you can put on a song that has the energy way up here. And then as long as you're breathing in time to it, you'll start to relax your body without even trying. And that can in turn relax your mind. Um, so the, the Pachelbel's Canon waterfall music does work for some people, but I think it's more helpful to go with preferred music and just let people pick whatever it is. And that can also lead to just a discussion about what people's favorite songs are. Like what do people actually like to listen to? And that keeps, if you keep it personalized like that, it allows, um, I think for greater engagement rather than trying to force everyone to relax by the same, by the same tool. Um, what else? So the other thing I've found to be helpful in groups, especially if you're doing groups on Zoom um, for musical improvisation is just trading 
fours or trading eights. So this kind of um, improvisation tool where you might be in one mode or you might have a key that you're playing in and everyone can have their own instrument or just use their voice or body rhythm and you just get a beat going and then allow everyone four bars to do whatever they want. You know, it's something silly, especially if it's little kids, they could do a dance move in those four beats. And as long as you have that beat going, it gives them the space to create something and express themselves within that structure. Um, and it avoids that issue, like I was talking about, of the, the delay over Zoom. Um, so if you can't make music simultaneously, you can still improvise together or, or even sing a composed piece together, but just trading, trading bars so that everyone gets a turn. And I think that's the other thing I like to think about is just um, giving people structure so that they're, they have a common goal. So our common goal is to create a piece of music together, but then there's room in it for everybody's contribution. And if you're working with a range of ages or a range of abilities, you can allow for any contribution to come in and be accepted by the group and integrate it into the music um, while avoiding that sort of pressure of hitting the wrong note or sounding good enough or coming up with something interesting enough, I suppose. Um, I do a lot of what we call fill-in songs with my groups. I don't know if any of you do, what, I don't, they might be called something else. Um, but a good example would be like peace like a river. I've got peace like a river. I've got peace like a river. That song. I will ask um, people, what are, what are you feeling today? What are you carrying with you today? And some people will say, um, I'm feeling happy. So we'll say, I've got happy like a river in my heart. Or some students might not understand the question or um, anything. They might say, I've got oranges. And we'll say, OK, I've got oranges like a river. And you just accept it. And so that student was able to participate in the music, add to the songwriting, and feel a really rewarding experience. Um, and we all sing it back to them, even though it wasn't really the, the correct response. Um, what else? Other examples of fill-in songs. I do this little light of mine a lot, um, but I I just sing that first verse. And I instead of light, I ask people to offer something that they're proud of. And then we sing, again, whatever they say that they're proud of. We, and if someone has a hard time coming up with something, we ask the group, like, what do you think they might be proud of? What do you like about this person? Um, what are some qualities you see in them? And then we all sing that together. So you can kind of do this group songwriting where everybody gets a chance to um, combine their experiences. And it starts to create connections between people which helps with confidence and some of those social and emotional goals. And then you can go further with that and rewrite entire verses to songs. So that's another good thing to kind of assign like, we're taking a song that we know that we might sing together and then everyone's going to go and write their own verse that has to do more with their personal experience. And then we'll come back and sing the chorus together. So it's a good way to kind of get into songwriting with either younger audiences or people who might be nervous to jump into just songwriting from scratch. Um, and also, again, if you have any kids with disabilities, you can really create space for them to put anything that they can into that song. So I work with a lot of people who are deaf and hard of hearing. Um, and so a lot of the music that we do is more about rhythm and movement and um, sort of vibration. So I bring instruments that are have very big vibrations, like large drums and um, large guitars that are pretty hollow. And we'll, we'll un detune the guitars to an open chord so that when you strum the guitar, you can feel the one chord. And then as long as you put your finger, you know, you can feel the five chord and then feel the seven. Um, and you can, you can really feel music in addition to playing it. So there's just a lot of different ways to experience music that are really different from the way that I experienced it taking lessons as a kid. I hope that makes sense. Um, 
And I feel like a lot of this is stuff that music teachers think about all the time anyway. Um, but a lot of us have kind of gotten stuck in that, <laughs> the traditional lesson way of thinking um, and also have these standards that we have to meet, obviously, for our classroom learning. So it kind of depends on your, your setting on what you're able to do as far as the standards go. But I do think, and especially at this point when all the students are home, it's a good opportunity to be more flexible and to really start to think more in like a creative improvis improvisatory way about music. And I think that actually further inspires kids to stay involved in music. Um, once the pressure is off a little bit, they start to really find their own voice and figure out what they like about music. Um, I'm saying that partially thinking about the clients that I've worked with, but also in my own experience, um, I found, you know, I was very good at she reading sheet music and sight reading growing up, and that helped a lot in orchestral music when I was in college, but I don't feel that I developed my ear until I went to grad school. And a lot of the classes in music therapy school were improv classes, but not your traditional um, jazz improv where you learn the chord structure and then play over it. It was go into a room with six other people and choose an instrument and then just kind of see what happens, that kind of improv. Um, and I thought that was terrifying when I first started it, but after a couple months of doing that a couple of times a week, my ear just developed so much. Um, and I'm not a singer. I had no training in, in voice lessons. Um, and it just really changed the way that I think about music and the way that I play music with other people. So I do think it's really beneficial to give both of those different kinds of opportunities. Um, I'm looking at my list about other sort of coping strategies. Kate, could so, I just, could I just oh, sure. pop in with one idea that just came to mind um, and yeah. it's tied to your group songwriting uh, mm -hmm. strategy or concept. So um, two, two different questions, I guess, on the same topic. One would be um, if, if our teachers on the call wanted to um, approach that as a way of getting kids to um, start to be a little more expressive about how they're feeling about, you know, the fact that maybe some of them are, are home alone for hours a day, every day, or home alone a lot if their parents are both uh, essential workers, um, or maybe they're home with their family all the time and they don't get any personal time to themselves. If you have students that either are reluctant to open up or students that maybe are offering, um, for lack of a better term, a, you know, a, a graphic representation of what they're feeling or what's happening. How might you work with those students, both the ones that are oversharing and the ones that are reluctant to share, to maybe try to level the playing field for everybody a little bit? Hmm. That's a great question. Um, I've experienced both of those things, and I think giving, finding a way to give opportunities. So. If you're gonna do, say, a songwriting exercise, um, you wanna not give everyone the same assignment about that songwriting exercise. So you wanna make sure that there is opportunity for anyone to offer whatever they can within it. Um, I recently did sort of a back and forth with somebody that didn't really wanna, or didn't feel ready, because now they are making music, um, but they wanted to draw instead. So I had them draw how they were feeling and then had the next person look at that drawing and create music about it. So it's sort of like playing the game of telephone where you pass it on and somebody adds something to it or changes it in some way and it becomes this kind of group art piece that gets passed around. Um, but with something like songwriting, you could say if you're comfortable to write a whole verse, you could. If you want to write a poem, you could. Um, the oversharing piece is interesting because I think it's up to the educator. Um, I always get into these conversations. So it's up to the educator, I think, to reframe what the person sends in in a way that's appropriate for the rest of the students. Um, because you want that student to, you want to acknowledge that their experience, whatever it is, is normal and um, that they're not alone. But if it's something that other students might not benefit from hearing about, you wanna find a way to share it with the class that allows for acceptance of that student at the same time. And that can be difficult. Um, 
I, every time I do a training, I have people ask about like, you know, rap songs and the swear words. And as a music therapist, we use all of that no matter what it is. But I know in, in education settings, it's very different with like the rules and um, the, what's appropriate or not for working with kids. So yeah, I would say having people send things to you, which creates more work sometimes, um, can be a good way to do it so that you can kind of filter things and say, you know, we're going to include parts of what everybody sends in so that everyone kind of recognizes if you say, here's the song that we created together, everyone can see their part in it, but maybe not all of it. That might be a good way to do it. Um, you could also have people, you know, journal or improvise on their own and then come back and say, what are some themes that came up for you? And then we're going to include those themes in the music that we're making together. Um, yeah, that's, it's difficult sometimes to have a range of experiences. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, there's a lot of people who are not feeling like they can have the space to be themselves in whatever setting they're living in right now. And that's a really tough one too. And I think that's finding a way to help people feel that they have a space, even if it's not a physical space. So finding a way to um, share a part of themselves, even if it's like holding something up to the screen. Um, yeah, that's a really difficult one. Yeah. So cre creating mental space, I think, is a way to think about that. Um, if someone's feeling like they don't have any privacy at home or just overrun with other people, not feeling very safe, um, so that's where that kind of meditation and mindfulness aspect comes in. Like how can you kind of go into yourself and um, remember, you know, what you love about yourself in some yeah. way. Yeah. Well, and I think that dovetails well with what, what my other question that came to mind when you were doing your, your in, introduction and overview um, is that, you know, we have, if I did it, asked everybody for a show of hands right now, which I'm not going to do, but um, if I said, how many of you are feeling lost um, because you're in a situation where perhaps your school leadership has has deemed you non-essential or enrichment, and you've been you've been pushed to the side for the remainder of the school year. Um, what are what are some ways that we maybe if you're if you're comfortable and willing to give our teachers some strategies for a, a little more self-care, you know, in mm -hmm. in helping them maintain a positive mindset when they're in a situation where they may or may not be able to engage um, regularly with their students. And that, mm -hmm. you know, for a lot of teachers, I'm sure you, you've experienced this, Kate, when you don't see some of your clients for a while, for whatever reason, it's, you know, it can be frustrating for you. It can be, it, it, it affects you in a way, in ways that you may or may not be, you're probably better equipped with it than, than some of us are. Um, so maybe, I don't know if you could speak to that a little bit about just helping everybody get themselves in a, in a better headspace than where they may be right now. Definitely. Um, and I can relate to that definitely because even as a, a music therapist um, with access to the hospital, like that's one of the first things that suddenly starts to be thought of as enrichment. And for a lot of the clients that I have, they live in group homes in social services agencies. And it's been really frustrating trying to get through the communication chain to meet with those clients. So no matter how badly they want to continue online, we have to rely on somebody to set it up for them. And it's just, it's been, it's been interesting kind of remembering like, yes, the arts are still in this, this place where we're thought of as some extra. Um, so I feel like I've spent a lot of time over the past couple of months trying to remind the general public through my networks that, you know, as people are at home and they're watching live streams of musicians performing and they're watching movies, it's like everything in everything that you engage in has an artist that made some part of it. Um, and without the arts, you would be bored to death. Um, so I really hope people will keep that in mind when this is all said and done because um, it is very frustrating. So I, I feel that, I feel that pretty hard. Yeah. Um, and yeah, therapists are, we are taught to have self-care. You know, you have to be in therapy while you're in school for therapy so that you can kind of get a feel for what it's like. Um, that being said, therapy isn't for everyone. And that was something I acknowledged when I came back to Maine. I 
part of my work has been with um, a lot of referrals in the hospital for people that refuse to talk to the social workers, but they will talk about their favorite music. And it creates this door that opens, it's sort of like a buffer or backdoor approach to therapy um, where you can connect with somebody musically and then open it to other things. So I think as music educators, the challenge is finding ways of self-care that don't further burn us out. Um, a lot of people will ask me like, oh, what, what things do you do for self-care? And to be honest, it's not usually music. Um, I would say if you're gonna use music as self-care to choose something that isn't your main instrument or to play your main instrument in a really different way. Um, and so sitting with it and just kind of getting to know your instrument again, thinking about it as if you're picking it up for the first time and maybe just improvising over one or two notes. Um, I think it was a Kenny Werner improv book. Um, if anyone's familiar with that, I can't remember the name of it right now, but it has some really good exercises for um, connecting with your instrument in kind of unusual ways. And that can be, that can be a helpful thing just to start to relax because we all know the benefits of music and there's so much research now about the health benefits of music. It is a really good self-care tool to be breathing in time to music, to be toning or singing to yourself. Um, but if you've been trying to teach music all day and especially half the kids aren't showing up or you're not getting support from your administration, it might be further frustrating to try to continue it at the end of the day. Um, so I think it's good to think about other ways that you feel good, that you feel positive. Um, and for me, that's actually been painting, which I am admittedly pretty bad at, but feels good to do. Um, exercising, there's a lot of meditation apps. Um, I, can't, I can't really recommend meditation apps because I don't seem to benefit from them. But like I said, you can meditate to like, a rock and roll song um, if you just sit with it and breathe in time to it. Um, drawing to music can be really helpful. So another exercise that I use a lot with some of my self-care groups is to take a big piece of paper and divide it into four pieces and then listen to four really different kinds of music and just allow yourself to kind of chalk in time to the music or along to it in some way. So not, not actually drawing, but just kind of like letting the pen flow. And then after you've done that, look at that, the page and see how different those styles are and um, just kind of explore how you're feeling, you know, through all of that. So it's a good way to explore like why different styles of music change our mood so much. And from there you can think, well, if I'm feeling really down, what could I listen to to, to change that? And again, think about that ISO principle of you don't want to just if you're at a nine, you don't want to listen to something that's at a two because you're not going to, it's going to be harder to meet in the middle. Um, so try to find something that's closer to how you actually feel and then move from there gradually. And that's something we do, you know, even working with people who are in a coma or unresponsive, you can match their heart rate or breathing rate with music and, and play it for a while. And then as you change the music, their breathing rate or heart rate will go with you. So it, physically affects us um, very quickly. So yeah, the most important thing if you're gonna use music for relaxation is to engage in it. Don't just put it on and expect that you'll suddenly feel relaxed because um, there's not really like any one style of music that will work. It's more about what you're doing with it. So even tapping your toe along to it or journaling while you listen, anything. Um, what else? Yeah, I think some perspective too is helpful. Um, and I don't mean that perspective like somebody has it worse because I hate that. <laughs> um, but perspective just uh, about how long this hopefully won't last. Um, Effortless Mastery, yes, thank you. I knew someone would know. <laughs> yeah, the book Effortless Mastery is a great um, improv book. Um, yeah, so perspective. I kind of mean in this really large way, I watched this, there's a really short film on Vimeo called Overview, which is about um, astronauts and the view of Earth from space. I know that's like way out there and we're talking about music education, but 
um, that little film totally changed my life because you just realize how small you are and how small this earth is and um, we're all doing really important work. And so it both matters and, and it's gonna be okay <laughs> at the same time. Um, so I think the important thing overall is like releasing some sense of expectation about the perfection that we're all so used to as musicians and as teachers. Um, but then also still being an example for the students of how important music is and how it's like this lifelong pursuit that's going to benefit us now and in every other difficult situation that's going to come down the line. So if we're thinking less right now about uh, meeting education standards and more about music as a way to connect with other people and to take care of ourselves, I think that's an example that will really last a lifetime for kids and keep them engaged in ways that we hadn't even thought of yet. Um, there's a couple other things I just had thought about that I've done with kids that have that are really great exercises and one is um, drumming for emotional regulation and obviously we're not in a classroom setting anymore and might not have access to drums but again percussion I know when I started it was like pots and pans and Actually, the school that I grew up at in Cornish, um, when I got to, I think it was fifth or sixth grade, we didn't have a drum set at the school. They just didn't have a budget for instruments. And so I took, um, I took drum set lessons on cafeteria stools. <laughs> I'm not even joking. Um, and then I, you know, I loved it enough that I kept going and I play drums still. Um, so if anybody knows Scott Thurston, he's the one that gave me those lessons. And um, it was awesome. So finding some ways to inspire kids to look around their house. And again, just like thinking about what sounds we hear in nature that might be musical. What do you see around you that could be musical? Whether that's body percussion, things you find in the recycling bin. Um, obviously, acknowledging that some kids might not um, make the best choices about that. So making sure to put some ground rules, like we're not going to smack our siblings' heads or um, break anything in the house. But finding some percussion instruments. And then um, if anyone knows about zones of regulation, so, um, and I don't work with kids a lot, so you probably know more about this than I do, but um, you can either think of one to five. So five is like if your energy is way up here, or really stressed, and one is if you're feeling really calm and relaxed. Um, and then some kids also think, and some therapists think in colors. So if you're at a red, you're way up here. And if you're at a blue or a green, you're pretty calm. And so you can assign music to that too. And this is something that based on your own curriculum, you might be able to um, flex like different rhythms or different instrument families into these zones. And then you can do a check-in with your students, like what are you feeling today? And someone might be like, I'm feeling a timpani, you know, or, or I'm feeling a, a cello note. Um, so whatever it is that you're teaching, you can kind of put into those zones of regulation. And as a percussion facilitator, I, I always have people drum, like if you're feeling a five, what does that sound like on the drum? It's a great way to drive parents crazy too at home. Um, if you're feeling a one, what does that sound like on a drum? And then, okay, we're all gonna drum at a one and gradually drum up to a five. And then we're gonna come down to a three. Then we're gonna drum down to a one. And so you can help kids recognize that range of um, emotion and energy level that we all have through hearing it and actually feeling it because drumming is, again, so vibratory. Um, so that's a great exercise to just help kids kind of learn to check in with their own regulation. And then it's also a good exercise to keep checking in and saying like, oh, it kind of seems like you're at a four and it would be helpful to be at a two for a while. Or like, what is a good place you can go in your house or on the lawn to express your five and then bring it down to a two before you come back in and take a break like that. Um, so that's a good exercise. I think anybody could kind of adapt to different situations um, and a good coping strategy. And then the other, the only other thing I think I had thought about um, as sort of a specific exercise is around the importance of practicing. So I've been talking a lot about um, lessening our expectations, but the reality is also there's students who um, 
are pretty serious or are in more serious music classes, um, or you just need them to, to actually practice um, what they're supposed to be learning. And the idea of muscle memory is a really interesting way to get students to sort of believe in that need to touch our instrument every day and to engage in music every day. Um, I've been reading this. So again, a lot of my self-care and continued sort of passion doesn't always come from music. And I've been reading this book by Twyla Tharp, who's a um, choreographer and dancer. And she has a chapter in it about um, muscle memory and how she will do the same movement. So something really basic, like if she's going to make a cup of coffee, she does it the same way every day for five or six days. And then she'll just, when she goes to that area, she tries to just see if she remembers exactly how she did it without telling herself. Um, and then she'll pick another task, something she's never done, and try to do it in a specific way every day for five days and see if her muscles just remember it. And I think that's an interesting exercise um, for anyone, but especially for kids who are like, I don't really want to practice every day. So not just telling them to practice their instrument every day, but try to do something every day for five days and kind of journal or think about how it feels on day one, how it feels on day three, and how it feels on day five, um, and especially how it physically feels in their body. And so just kind of teaching that, that muscle memory is a huge part of learning an instrument or even learning a piece of music, um, and that repetition is is part of what makes things easier. Does that make sense? It's a little hard to explain that one, um, but that's something that you could really allow kids to individualize. Like they can pick anything that they wanna do and it doesn't have to be school related, it doesn't have to be music related, but just allowing them to learn that through, through experiencing it and feeling it can be a really powerful way to get them thinking like, oh, maybe I should pick up my food every day. <laughs> so. Yeah. Does anyone have any questions? I always feel like I'm rambling. No, I think your I think your insight's been great, Kate. Thank you for that. Um, mm -hmm. Is there is there anyone in the group that's comfortable talking about how they're feeling right now, or how their students are feeling, or any any questions related to that? This is a an incredibly um, introspective, sensitive topic, which is really great, and we we need to be aware of that. Um, as arts professionals um, and teachers, but anyone anyone care to share any feelings of what they're what they have going on in their classes now? I am interested too if music teachers do you use music for yourself? Um, like, do you go home and put on the same music that you like to listen to when you were a kid, or do you feel burnt out from it? Go ahead, Charlie. Yeah, I put on the oldie station when I'm tooling around. I do, my wife and I, Didi, we take rides on a daily basis just to get the heck out of the house. And we're tooling down the highway with the oldie station on. Cool. But I was gonna say we had a staff meeting the other day and it's interesting to see who's doing what. Like some people are sending out videos. I haven't gotten that far yet, but um, Pender Macon, our um, commissioner of education says, don't forget you're doing emergency teaching, not distance teaching. So be kind to yourself. Whatever you're doing, mm -hmm. you've really come a long way. So I feel really happy about what I've been doing. We've all taken a, the learning curve's been steep and quick. Mm -hmm. I think we'll come out on the other side feeling better about the teaching profession as a whole. I love everything Pender's been putting out. <laughs> Oh, I think Len go, raised your Yeah, hand. go ahead, Len. Yeah. Um, I had a, a weird class the other day. Uh, it was fifth grade class. I had 15 kids show up. And I had a lesson all planned from Teach Rock on uh, designing an electric guitar. And uh, I said, what would you like to do? Would you like to do the lesson on designing your own guitar? Or would you like to sing songs? And they all put in the chat, we want to listen to you sing songs. So I took requests for, for an hour and I just played my guitar and sang songs to them and they just kind of sat there and watched and it was just really weird. I mean, I kept asking them 
are you okay? You know, I'd pick out each child and say, you know, Johnny, are you feeling okay today? Or, you know, is something wrong? And no, everything's fine. But they just, there was like, no, they just look so sad. <laughs> they just look so sad. And all they wanted to do was listen to me sing to them. So I, I don't know if, is that okay to do that? Just to yeah. sing to them? Is that okay? I mean, it was weird. Oh, yeah. It's they so picked good out the songs them. and I just sang whatever they wanted to hear. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a big piece of this too, is like, just being authentic. This, this is a strange opportunity. It might feel weird, but it's like the students get to see you as a person and see that, you know, everyone's feeling pretty weird right now. So they're feeling less alone. And then, yeah, I mean, as musicians, you have something huge to offer that isn't just education based. It's like, that's magical. And yeah, just listening to music, like their, their bodies will start to relax. And it's awesome. Oh, yeah. Charlie, did you have a similar similar situation? Well, I was just going to say one of my goals is try to meet, try to go to a class meeting of every class I teach, and I've been to a few in the primary school, and I've noticed the first time they did it, they were really chatty. Now the teacher, wet, we're in six weeks into it, is trying to pull stuff up out of them. So I don't think that reaction you got, Lynn, was, was anything unusual. I think the kids are starting to become what I call hollow. I think this experience has dragged every bit of creativity out of them and us. And now they're just like, oh, what do we do next? Not, I, I, I know what it is. The novelty's worn off. Yeah, maybe. So don't, don't worry if it seems weird. It's just where they are right now. I think a lot of kids are in, in the very same space and the teachers too. Yeah. Um, Any, I, anybody I else? Found, Go ahead. Yeah. I found that um, I've been going to, I went to some kindergarten and first grade this morning and I'm finding if I pop into a Zoom meeting at least once a week, they'll do more of the music activities that we put out as a, as a school. And for my band kids, in the beginning, they didn't care if it was structured, even though I gave them structured times. All of a sudden I'm getting emails. I need a time every single week, same time, same place. So now I'm setting up more Zoom meetings and they're getting private lessons pretty much because um, they really want to do better. I mean, I'm trying to look for different music and stuff to give them and they're just getting excited all of a sudden. I mean, not everybody. I still struggle with the kids who I've never seen, but I just hope that maybe they'll come back in the fall. That's my biggest worry is that the kids that have been non-existent trying to keep up with their academics and kind of let music kind of go by the wayside. That's... I mean, that's my biggest fear, but hopefully we can get them back. But I'm just finding kids, just, they're just looking for extra things to do. That's all. You know, the, except it's sort of the same old same. I mean, math and reading is wonderful, but it's usually repetitious. Whereas the music and art, we can do different things. So like our district put out a bingo board. So every two weeks, we have a phys ed, health, art, music bingo board across the district. We send it out and kids can pick whatever they want. They have two self-care days a week. So, and that's helped a lot because kids are actually doing it on their own time, but they're cool. doing it, so. And you can combine art and music too. I, we, I do these trainings with an art therapist, Bodie Simpson, she's in Waterville and um, we are always training people to try to combine art and music because, yeah. and especially in the situation, some of you have been commenting like kids are feeling too shy or uncomfortable to, to make music at their house. Um, so it's a good opportunity to say like, if you, you don't want to sing, you could draw this instead, or you could get out some magazines and collage or um, create something out of clay and just kind of bounce back through with the different arts modalities. Um, same with that drumming and emotional regulation exercise. You can dance the movement instead. If you don't, if you can't make noise in your house, you can think about like how it feels in your body and make a movement that matches one through five. Um, and it's also just important to recognize like the kids just like us are all going through these experiences in different ways. And so some people are going to be super energetic and want new things to do. And some people are just going to feel super depressed some days um, and just come on and stare silently into the screen. And so I think it's important to acknowledge that range and also accept it both for yourself and for the kids. So if you have a day that you wake up and you're just destroyed, just let yourself cry in the shower for a while um, and then get on and be like, here's what I have to offer today. And it might not be that much and that's okay. Go ahead, Charlie. Um, our tech 
department sends out funny cartoons and the other day they had a teacher staring at the screen with a deadpan look and the message was, you have 753 emails. <laughs> <laughs> but I think what you said about the connection is important because I noticed this morning, I really pay attention to the little guys and yesterday I was on a first grade one. One was hanging upside down off the couch, but he was paying attention. You know, another one was underneath the blanket. They just need that connection. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. they don't care what you're saying as long as you're saying, hi, how are you? And you know, what did you do today? I mean, when I do a Zoom meeting, even for a lesson, the first thing I start out with, tell me about your day, tell me about your week, you know, mm -hmm. um, what did you do? Like one planted seeds and I just get excited about that. And then we get down to the lesson and they're more calm and they're more ready to focus because they think you're interested in what they're doing because right now they have the same people every day in and out so at least we're a novelty at least i call us all novelty. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny yeah and you never know when someone's paying attention i um i have this client she's in her mid 40s and she has developmental disabilities and is nonverbal. and i worked with her for a couple of months um and she has you know one of those ipads with a talking screen so that she can kind of share different things um but pretty limited but she has pictures of her family and so she would point to the picture of her family and click on it and it would say the name and one said mama and so i started creating songs around those names and like three months into our sessions i really didn't feel like we were making any progress um, and then i got a letter from her mom that she had started to sing mama when her mom would call and she had never talked to her before um, so you just never know when you're getting through to someone. So I feel like even the kid hanging upside down on the back of the couch is probably soaking in everything you're saying, even if it doesn't seem like it. Yeah. Looking at our chat. I know, box. I know too, Kate, that um, there are some colleagues of ours around the state that, and again, this is de depending on the developmental uh, level age in age group that you're working with, but I know that they're engaging their their students in a lot of listening. And I know Rob alluded to this in the chat box and a lot of other people have, have mentioned this as well. Um, you know, suggesting songs for them to listen to that mean something to us. It's reinforcing that personal connection that we have with them that we can have over a great distance by sharing in the same piece of music. So whether it's a, a collective, group listening session through a Zoom session, or it's sending out a link to, or sending out a title, um, or a link to a song to listen to, um, or even with a set of lyrics, and just, you know, uh, giving them something to listen to that they can, uh, that can maybe help them in this time right now with just, mm -hmm. How to how to feel how to process their own feelings about it and how to how to just find some you know to continue to have the enjoyment in music and experiencing music. It's not it's clearly not the same as making it you know with their friends or whatever but you know in in these with these limited circumstances that we have in some cases. Um, but then, you know, we have we have some situations around the state where we are having trouble. I bet there may be some some of you on this call that um, haven't seen your kids yet since this has all been gone because of uh, connectivity issues and access to devices and whatnot. So that's another big, big significant challenge that um, I know that a lot of um, there's a team in the Department of Education that's working very hard to um, connect every kid in the state and I believe that by the time the summer rolls around they will have done it which is remarkable because that's tens of thousands of devices so and we have our our uh, our philanthropists around Maine our philanthropic families and organizations to um, to support all of that. Kate, I think you're getting a, a command audience of the cat there. Yeah, that is my cat, actually. <laughs> That's your cat. Well, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Very <Maya>. nice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think about that a lot. Um, I am only seeing two of my clients, and one of them doesn't show up every other week, and part of it is staffing, but there's that huge issue of internet connectivity in Maine, and it's 
it's a little depressing to think about how many people are just unable to get on and the assumptions that administrators and other people have about like, oh, just do this video. And also for music teachers, like, oh, just make one of those group videos, you know, it's so easy. And the reality is it's going to take you a long time unless you're extremely skilled, which I'm not with that technology stuff. Those cutesy videos that we're seeing coming out really take a long time to put together um, and a lot of effort. So yeah, just kind of dealing with the realities of what's actually possible right now is interesting. <laughs> he's setting a great example. <laughs> I know he's, he's, at least he's being calm. That's nice. <laughs> well, um, in our last few minutes, does anyone have anything else that they would like to, to add? Rob, I think you and I can maybe talk a little bit about another, another session going forward and some topics that maybe have floated by. Um, speaking of which, if any of you have any topics that you'd like to um, have us talk about during this time going forward, you know, please always send me an email. Um, I'm easy, easy to get a hold of or you can send something to Rob or just connect somehow and I can get a message, definitely. Um, I, I just want to make sure, uh, you know, there's the free form Friday phrase. Um, I think this has been free form days ending in the letter Y. <laughs> and we're all just going with it. And uh, these Thursday afternoons have really been all over the place, but quite intentionally. Um, and Kate, thank you so much for contributing so much to what this Thursday was for us. Uh, comforting to hear in addition to giving us some really practical um, things to think about for our own classes. So I, I just want to make sure and include that before we leave today. Thank you so much. Thanks, Thanks for having me. Nice Absolutely. to see you all. Yeah, thanks again for your time, Kate. I appreciate it, and that was that was really wonderful. I think that, that you know, not to not to echo everything that Rob said, but yeah, I would think it was right right up everybody's alley as to what we what we needed to hear, and and just even some some reassurance of what we are doing with our students when we can and how we can uh, is is going to make a difference um, in the long run. Every every little bit, every little bit helps. Uh, everyone, I put the link um, to the. Uh, survey for the PD certificate in the chat box. So if you want to snag that before we leave the session, or you can save the chat as well. Yeah, it's it all... not a link though. Uh, it should be. It's not coming out as a link. It's just coming out as an address. Okay, if you copy and paste it, Linda, into your yeah, web I browser. Yeah, I just should be... I can do that. Yep. Yep. You should be able to do that easy enough. It came out as a link in mine. That's weird, but I guess everybody's setup is a little bit different but anyway thank you so much again kate for your time thank i appreciate you. it thanks have a great thank day you, thank you all for your time and um and i'll be in touch about uh topics for the future awesome all right thank, thank you. you all so much Bye.